10 minutes ago, this is how I was going to actually start this talk unless, until things change very quickly. This is what I was going to say. On Sunday, June 30th, 2 million people are set to protest in Cairo outside of the presidential palace to demand that the Muslim Bre uh, Brotherhood, President Mohammed Morsi, who was elected a year ago, step down to allow for early presidential elections. Hundreds of thousands of uh, others will be holding similar protests uh, also on Sunday in cities and towns and villages across Egypt. That was 10 minutes ago until I ran into friends and the demonstrations and the tens of thousands have actually already started uh, in Cairo and around the country because the Brotherhood <laughs> because the Brotherhood shows no sign of giving in, and the United States, which is the main backer of the Brotherhood in Egypt, shows no sign of uh, dropping their support for the Brotherhood at this uh, point. The June 30th mass action is actually the culmination of an intensive six-week um, grassroots effort, which is unprecedented in the two and a half <laughs> years of the Egyptian revolution for weeks. Uh, more than 300,000 people have been collecting more than 17 million petitions in a campaign named Rebel to force uh, early elections. We collected signatures <coughs> uh, at traffic lights, in factories, among striking workers, in schools, and workplaces, in villages, even in the deep south, uh, in the poor deep south, which is the historic social base of the Brotherhood and the Islamists. <clears throat> now, most supporters of the campaign are people who favor the revolution, and many voted for Mohammed Morsi in the presidential elections against Ahmed Shafi in June 2012, Ahmed Shafi being the Mubarak era candidate. But it was <clears throat> a disappointing year for the supporters of the revolution as the Brotherhood not only failed to deliver on the promises of improving the living standards of millions of poor people who voted for them on that basis, but worse yet, <laughs> the Brotherhood continued the Mubarak era neoliberal policies and pushed them to higher levels, levels that Mubarak himself would not have dreamed of. The Brotherhood government, uh, under the guidance of the International Monetary Fund, uh, has rationed bread for the very first time in Egypt in 40 years. Three loaves to a citizen uh, every single day. This is a country that relies on bread as a main source of protein. The Brotherhood announced plans Mubarak would not have dared to sell all public utilities, water, electricity, uh, railways, uh, 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 you know, collect them into bonds and sell them to private and international um, investors. And instead of bringing justice to, uh, <coughs> in, instead of bringing to justice the police officers who killed protesters during the January Revolution, something the, pro the Brotherhood promised to do, they actually let the police loose on demonstrations and strikers over the course of the last 12 months, killing tens and injuring hundreds in the past year. And instead of providing justice and equality to Copts and minorities as they promised, they unleashed a sectarian campaign attacking churches at a number of points and actually demonizing a very small Shiite minority, uh, which led to the horrible slaining, killing of four Shia Egyptians just a few days ago. All of this uh, under the incitement of the Muslim Brotherhood. In other words, over the course of the last year, the Brotherhood played a key counter-revolutionary role, which earned it, of course, the support of the United States, but also earned it the wrath of millions of poor people, and millions of them are former supporters of the Brotherhood, people who voted for them. One thing the Brotherhood delivered on, not to the poor, of course, but to the US government, which sponsored it, as I said, from day one, since the fall of Mubarak, the Brotherhood guaranteed, in ways that Mubarak was never even able to do, the security of the state of Israel. Now, Israel 
has demanded for years that it install electronic monitoring devices over uh, the um, Gaza-Sinai border, something even Mubarak could not do in order to control uh, the movement of resistance in and out uh, of Gaza. The Brotherhood gave that to Israel last summer. Now, the rebel campaign, um, <coughs> on a basic level, um, provides revolutionaries with a unique opportunity to push back both the counter-revolutionary brotherhood, but also open space to renew a larger fight against the Mubarak ruling class, which is still intact till this very, very uh, minute. The campaign also on another level, and this is, I think, very important, and in a very convoluted way, in a very contradictory way, as is always the case in revolutions, the campaign is not uh, just a battle between revolutionary camp on the one side, the millions who support the rebel campaign, and counter-revolution uh, headed by the Brotherhood at this moment. On another level, uh, it's uh, uh, because many supporters of the Mubarak regime have actually joined the rebel campaign, have penetrated the rebel campaign in city after city, hoping to pressure the Egyptian army to carry out a military coup that would not only rid uh, the scene of the Brotherhood, the historic uh, enemy of the Egyptian ruling class, at least for the past 40, 50 years, but more importantly, not only to get rid of the Brotherhood, but to use the opportunity of a military coup in order to crush the revolution once and for all. You are sp so it is not simply a revolution versus counter-revolution. You have contradictory, convoluted situation, and it's important to navigate those seas. It's a ruling class that is absolutely frightened. Egypt has witnessed 9,500 strikes, work stoppages, uh, road blockages, highway blockages, uh, over lack of social services in the past year alone. Almost 350 strikes, workplace actions, and social protests every single month, the highest probably uh, in the history of the last few decades anywhere else in the world. I'm going to finish on that. Yeah. Um, the ruling class hoped a year ago, and I mean, some of our speakers, especially Haney, will um, develop on that, hoped that the Brotherhood could play a counter-revolutionary role, could put an end to the upheaval in Egypt, but the Brotherhood has completely failed and has actually worsened the situation uh, 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 in the past uh, year. And so far, the United States, as I said, supports uh, the Brotherhood and has uh, the American ambassador in Cairo held a three-hour meeting a few days ago, the second in command of the Brotherhood, and came out and said that Morsi must stay for four years. Uh, and we support uh, the elected uh, president. However, the U.S. is trying to pressure the Brotherhood at this moment to bring in liberal, leftist, socialist parties into a national coalition, into a national unity uh, cabinet in order, as a, as a last resort, to really preempt the mass uprising that the rebel campaign promises to unleash. And the situation, and I'll end here, uh, remains more or less uh, fluid as many ordinary people, not just ruling class people who want a military coup, many ordinary people who actually oppose military rule because of the misery they have lived under during a one year of the Brotherhood are now open to the idea or the hope or the illusion that the military which you know could come in, carry out some kind of a military intervention for a few weeks, get rid of the Brotherhood, and we can return to electoral politics. We can have new elections. Unfortunately, this is also the situation we find ourselves in inside of the rebel campaign. And so far, a, a, a fantastic group uh, on the far left in Egypt uh, that includes the April 6 movement, the revolutionary socialists, and even a left breakaway from the Brotherhood called the Strong uh, Egypt uh, party, which uh, won almost three million votes in the presidential elections. We managed to play a key role in building the rebel campaign, but we didn't also pull out of the rebel campaign when people began flirting with the idea of a military coup. We stayed inside of the rebel campaign and argued that we have to focus, we have to use this mass unbelievable uh, outburst of grassroots organizing in order to build a movement, a lasting movement that could 
uh, challenge both the Brotherhood, but more importantly, the bigger ruling class. We say no to the Brotherhood, and we also say no to a military coup or an, a return to the Mubarak uh, years. I want to stop here, uh, and um, I just wanted to give you just a sense of the current situation uh, to save some of our speakers' time, instead, uh, not to get into the details of what's happening right now in the last 24, 48 hours, and introduce uh, first, uh, Hany Shukrallah, he's uh, the founding editor of uh, the Ahram Online, which uh, I'm proud to be part of that team. We are the revolutionary uh, voice of what's happening in Egypt in English, and Hany is a long-time uh, revolutionary Marxist since the late 1960s, and uh, he is the author of Egypt, the Arabs, and the world, which is a fantastic book on um, the Arab rebellion. So please welcome Haney. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mustafa. Thank you all. Uh, uh, I'm actually very, uh, I feel very privileged to be here. I, uh, uh, obviously, uh, you know, I've, I've been to a few conferences uh, abroad uh, in the past two years. We, we, we've become very sexy in the past two years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, really, this is the first time I feel really at home. I feel bit among brothers and sisters, uh, comrades. Uh, Uh, obviously, I'm sure all three of us are quite conflicted also about being about outside Egypt at this time. We'll catch up. It's it's not going to end uh, very a anytime soon. So, uh, what I hope to do is to. I was asked to speak on the Egyptian Revolution, which is, of course, or what's happened to the Egyptian Revolution, which is a, a huge question and. Uh, uh, very difficult to deal with in you know in in the 20 25 minutes I've been asked to speak. Uh, so what I'll try to do is to suggest a number of key conclusions of m which which constitute the main elements of my my reading of the Egyptian Revolution during the past uh, two and a half years. I'll try to whiz through them to. So as not to take too much of your time or to bore you too much. Uh, and, uh, and then we can discuss whatever you feel. We, uh, I'll ple and please stop me if I elaborate too much. I tend to talk too much. So, uh, OK, the first, the first conclusion, the most general conclusion, is that I'm convinced that the, the ongoing wave of Arab revolutions that has uh, been uh, launched in Tunisia in 2010 and continues to this day uh, constitutes a new historical trajectory for the Arab world. This is, this I think, the big picture because sometimes we lose sight of through all the details. This is the big picture. A new page has been opened in Arab history. And I think it's as dramatic and as profound in its rupture with the past as the two axiomatic uh, ruptures that modern Arab history is made out of, as or, or, or at least is modeled around, which is the Napoleonic, the, uh, the aftermath of Napoleon's conquest of Egypt in uh, 1798, and then the post-World War, the post-colonial era, which paradoxically uh, involved also the colonization of Palestine on uh, the, being the second uh, major transformation, major historical transformation in modern Arab history, I believe we're entering a new stage. And this, and, and if all the details need to be seen in, within this. Uh, and here what I'm saying is the salient fact is that in this is that the Arab peoples are currently engaged in remaking and rewriting their own history. And it looks to be a winding, protracted, and torturous process full of pain, suffering, upheavals, and chaos. But a new page in modern Arab history has been turned. My second 
basic conclusion is that the Arab revolutions launched basically by a new young Arab generation, uh, uh, that these young people who were able to be actually reach for the stars were wholly unprepared for the tasks their own uprisings had put on their shoulders. Uh, I'll here just refer very fast to, uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of, of Muhammad Hassan in Hikr, a very prominent uh, Egyptian journalist and, and uh, political analyst. And he made this metaphor about that, that the Egyptian revolution, he said, was like someone landing on the moon. And then they asked him, OK, what do you want as a reward? And he thought about it a bit. And he, then he said, a, a falafel sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> this is not to say that these young people did not know, did not have an image, actually a very clear image of the kind of Egypt, the kind of transform transformation they want. But they didn't. They, they really were wholly unprepared for how to go about achieving that Egypt. So they were able to topple these series of regimes, one after the other, uh, obdurate regimes that, had, that seemed eternal. And uh, actually, that the rulers were convinced that they were eternal and, and, and succeeded maybe in convincing us that they were eternal. That they, they fell within, you know, like, like so many, a house of cards, but really, they didn't, we, the, the people who made the revolution were unprepared for how to carry it forward. And this is, to my mind, due to a number of things. First of all, let me make two, two points. Because some people have ex tried to explain this by saying, well, these were leaderless revolutions. I'm, I'm a bit hesitant to accept this proposition because actually I believe that all revolutions, in a sense, all popular revolutions, not coup d'etat, all popular revolutions are leaderless. How people move from compliance, fear, submission to this moment where all these walls collapse and they rise up, I think. <laughs> no one can push them to do this. Uh, it's impossible to predict. You can always explain it retrospectively. You can you know, find hundreds of reasons. But wh how this moment comes together, I think it's, there's something. <laughs> uh, I read somewhere, if anybody, I haven't been able to find a reference yet. But I remember it, that uh, Bertolt Brecht had said that human behavior, the problem with human behavior is not that it's not subject to determination, but that determinants are too many. And obviously, when you get too many determinants, you get unpredictability. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so it's not that it was not leader, that, that it was leaderless. And in fact, there was, once people, the young, it was triggered. It was not that unorganized as well. It was triggered by young people. And these young people were organized. They did not make it, but they triggered it. They had triggered it. And they provided it with field leadership. In fact, there was something quite stunning about the level of organization of Tahrir during these 18, 18 days. Uh, uh, but having said this, we still need to explain why were they not able, why was this revolution so easily hijacked? And here I think we can, we have to understand the background, the 30 years of, of Mubarak. And the Again, you cannot say because, well, Mubarak was a police state, an authoritarian police state, because that begs the question of an anti-authoritarian revolution. 
<coughs> so you can justify your, your, your inability to carry the revolution through by the fact that the regime was authoritarian. So it's not, it, it wasn't really that uh, the authoritarianism of the regime as such, but my belief is that it was the eradication of politics over the 30 years of Mubarak. And this is, this, again, I'll try to be very, very brief and not, but again, my conclusion is that we had a transition under, the, under Mubarak, especially under Mubarak, it had its beginnings before that, to an oligarchic system, political and economic system, uh, in which basically the ruling classes and the various groups within, within the ruling classes, rather than appropriate or, or exert their influence on the state through the mediation of politics, which, which is what normally happens, is that they found a much easier way to get, to, to, to create these uh, conglomerates of bi top bureaucrats and top businessmen behind the back of politics. And uh, the examples of this and the ramifications of it are, are just enormous. Uh, and, and in fact, you, you had, you know, so parliament becomes more a chamber of commerce. It becomes uh, more a site of business than a site of politics. And the business of governance stops being a competition over hegemony and uh, rather it becomes fear and patronage. These were the two instruments of, of uh, rule in Egypt, fear by police state and patronage. And here they had a very, something actually, it happened probably spontaneously but it was very clever, is selective repression. So within the political and intellectual elite, the repression was very light. And you could produce newspapers criticizing the government, you could uh, form uh, opposition news party, uh, uh, opposition parties and so on. But once you move outside the elite, for the working class and for the poor, it's a vicious police state that deals only in murder, uh, extrajudicial killing, torture, and, uh, and, and uh, I'm sure a, a, uh, many of you have, have been following the torture became a daily routine. And, 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 and that's one of what, that was one of the main triggering factors of that people, that young people, young lower middle class and working class people felt that they could be humiliated, abused, killed, tortured to death for no reason whatsoever, just because a police officer felt like it at one moment. Uh, and this, of course, helped create, deepen the divide between the political, the so-called political class politi and, and the masses. And it, it helped perpetuate it and keep it because, you know, for uh, you could be meeting in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in party headquarters and shouting down with Mubarak. Uh, and you're safe to do it and you go home or you go out and have a beer afterwards. But a worker who strikes can go to prison, can be tortured, can be killed. So, and a third, yet a third aspect of this was that in, in the absence, this eradication, real eradication of political space, and if any of you would like to discuss it further, we can do that later. In the absence of political space, political contest becomes ideological. And ideology in the absence of politics becomes religion. So really, political, con the pol political struggle in Egypt for, the th for much of the 30 years of Mubarak became an ideological, become a, became a religious struggle, a struggle between different doctrines, liberals and uh, Marxists and, and Islamists. And, and, and when there is no test of politics, when there is no, uh, it, it becomes competing religions. And obviously the, 
the most sacred religion there is will triumph. Uh, so, so this is the this is the backdrop, in my view, that 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 made the revolutionaries, uh, that made the Egyptian people who were able to do this enormous thing unprepared to carry it through. Uh, So we had we had this revolution with Chad declared its principles: bread, freedom, social justice, and human dignity. Writ large, it had a moral imperative. It had tremendous courage. Again, this is something that one really cannot exaggerate. But had no strategy and tactics. It had no political or organizational experience. And this is where we faced the collapse of the Mubarak regime with. Then we come to yet a third aspect of the Egyptian revolution. Somehow there is something, there was something very classical about the Egyptian revolution. It was almost, you know, the French revolution or the Bolshevik revolution revisited somehow. Because it was an urban revolution. And this created, and, and really, the countryside was outside it, and remained so for quite some time. And this urban, because what, what happens actually in, in this kind of revolution, again, if we look at, the, at, at either the French or the Russian revolution, is that the, an urban revolution will, will win power, and then will win the peasantry by land reform. And since we have a hijacked revolution, so there was, no, there was no one that had a stake in winning over the peasantry. So the act actually, for a long time, for the past two and a half years, uh, the, the, the rural Egypt was the reserve army of the counter-revolution. And if you look at the presidential elections, the first round, it was almost, and, and actually every election that was held during that period, the divide is massive. Countryside is divided between state patronage and religion, and the cities are revolutionary and democratic. Uh, then, my fourth main conclusion, I will uh, we, I can discuss it uh, under, I, I, I published an article a few months ago, uh, Stuff I remembers it, titled The Decline and Fall of the Muslim Brotherhood. And this, I actually, again, I may be a bit too, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, but I believe actually what we are witnessing is not just a decline of and fall of the Muslim Brotherhood, we are witnessing the closing of, or the twilight of the so-called Islamic revival that we have been seeing for the past, or we had been seeing for the past 30 years. I think we are seeing the end of political Islam, historically, from a historical point of view. And of course, with this, a whole dominant paradigm collapses, which is that, you know, it was, the, Muslims are inherently Islamic. You cannot understand their political behavior unless with reference to Islam. And uh, it's either police states or Islamist regimes. This was the, uh, and, and this is one of actually the important, I think, elements behind uh, US support for the Muslim Brotherhood. They felt that. I will not elaborate on the Muslim Brotherhood's record in power. Uh, Mustafa uh, spoke on it. Uh, but I think several things we just need to touch on. One is that we got the Muslim Brotherhood at its worst, the worst period in its, in its modern, at least in its, in its late uh, incarnation since in the, in the, uh, during the late 70s and, and until now. By 2008, the so-called political wing of the Muslim Brotherhood had been almost wholly disempowered 
wholly removed from the leadership. And it was totally in the grip of the so-called organizational wing, which was the most backward, the most reactionary, the most uh, uh, fundamentalist and doctrinaire uh, section of uh, the movement. And any of you, I'm sure a lot of you have a lot of organizational experience and you've all read about the history of the Russian Revolution. So <laughs> usually it's the people who are in charge of the organization who get rid of the thinkers and the, <coughs> the political. <coughs> Stalin being, of course, a prominent example. So, so that's one aspect. We got them at their worst. And then we also there was something which, which, which I've described as the profaning of the Muslim Brotherhood. They came down from their, this, you know, sublime realm of being victims and, and basically holy men, and they came through, uh, down to earth. And the realities of power and of politics and of political struggle, and this exposed them so far. <coughs> Obviously, one clear example was in the parliamentary elections in 2011, they get, they get uh, sorry, 17 million votes, no, 12, sorry, 12 million votes. By December of the same year, December, January, December 2011, two January 2012, uh, these are down to 5 million votes in the first round of the presidential election. I don't know if there is any historical experience of a party losing seven million voters in, in five or six months, but uh, if you know, please tell me. Uh, and, and this has been going. We, we are witnessing something unprecedented in this the swiftness with which the Brotherhood has lost whatever goodwill whatever political base, whatever uh, support it had. Uh, it is amazing. It is now very difficult to find someone who will say anything good about them. And the amount of anger is enormous. Part of this is their, they are frenzied. As I was saying, we got them at their worst moment. We got them after they had got rid of, of the, the cadre, you know, their most sophisticated, their most politically savvy cadre. At the same time, they are pushed by these twin impulses of the sense, okay, this is the Islamist moment. And a lot of, you know, Western pundits and have been telling them this, and journalists and so on. This is the Islamist moment in the Arab world. So they feel, finally, it's come to this. We're, taking over in Libya, in Tunisia, in Syria, in whatever. At the same time, they realize that it's very fleeting. They re so it's, it, it makes for this frenzied attitude, if we don't grab power now and as fast as possible, it's, we'll, uh, it, will it will not come again. OK. Finally, we come to Tamarut again. Mustafa talked about it, but I really believe this is, we are witnessing a turning point, a new turning point in the Egyptian revolution. Because Tamarud gave us something very new. First of all, it restored the leadership of the revolution to the young people. Part of what happened during the two and a half uh, years since, since uh, January 25 is that what I call the old geezers of my generation, <laughs> took the, the young people under their wing and really got them into their, all their, their baggage, which, which, was, which was not a baggage of born of the revolution, which was a baggage born, born out of you know, years of com petty compromises. And, and, uh, so Tamarud, the rebel movement, restored the leadership of the revolutionary process to the young people. Another very significant, I think, uh, transformation is that, and again, Mustafa referred to this, is that it moved beyond the template of Tahrir. The young revolutionaries had 
had this template which succeeded for, and they kept trying to repeat it, trying to repeat. So you call for one million man march after another, and sometimes people show up, sometimes they don't. But with the Marut, they went out. And they went out to the people, and they went out to the countryside, and for the first time, you broke through this rural-urban divide. Of course, the Muslim Brotherhood helped a lot by their ineptitude and their <laughs> pushing the country basically to starvation. And uh, finally, there is the, the problematic of a very profound fracture, both in the ruling class and the state and actually to probably to levels unprecedented even. Uh, this is making for, for a rather murky situation because it's, it, I think it's, the revolution is a bit confused uh, about, about how to deal with it, I'm almost done. Uh, because I think it's, it's a very good thing to have a divided ruling class who wants to be united. And it's not at all bad to have the state, you know, at its, uh, you know, different organs of the state at each other's throats. Again, it's, it's a very nice thing. <laughs> so, and actually, it's what makes for a revolutionary situation, I mean, if, uh, you know, everywhere. Uh, the point here is, how do you ensure that you don't fall, you and your mass base? even more important. They don't fall under the sway of one, of one wing or another. And this really is, is not by trying to erect walls around the people, because no one can, but is how to distinguish yourself, how dis to distinguish the revolutionary voice politically, programmatically, uh, or, and organizationally. I'm going to end. <laughs> okay, uh, no, let me just end with one, one note, one note. Uh, in 2011, the then Secretary General of the uh, ruling, Mubarak's ruling party, the NDP, uh, this was January 2011, and he made this very confident statement, Egypt is not Tunisia. Uh, in June of this, earlier this month, uh, Ambassador Ann Patterson, U.S. Ambassador to Cairo, made again a very confident statement, Morsi is not Mubarak. A couple of days ago, I, may, I tweeted famous last words. <laughs> so. Thank you. It's difficult to come after Hany. He's an inspiring activist and writer uh, for me, for my generation. He's not old, but uh, at least. Um, and uh, but I have an excuse that actually I was uh, I stepped in in the panel. I was not planned to speak, so I was asked to talk two days ago. So um, this is an excuse. Uh, so I will start with uh, uh, some amazing, amusing, uh, entertaining. Uh, exchange actually it happened two days ago in the st in a state department presser uh, just to read some quotes from this presser and then we'll start to uh, and I will be uh, I have some bullet points about in general about the transition uh, what happened after the revolution like bullet points uh, so this is a presser uh, with a US diplomat in the State Department and one journalist asking him um, um, do you think the regime, the Muslim Brotherhood regime, is doing the same things that the previous regime was doing against the freedom of expression and violating the freedom of, of demonstrating and expressing against the opposition? Well, look, this is a diplomat quote. Well, look, democracy requires compromise and concessions on everyone's part. On Egyptian democratic transition is no different. So we hope that Egyptians will find a way to work together peacefully to address their concern. Question. This is not an answer to my question, for my question. Uh, and diplomat quotes, and question, what about the regime? The regime is doing the same things. Um, answer, quote, 
you just heard, I had a very clear message, both for the Egyptian people and the government of Egypt, and the message that peaceful demonstrations should be allowed, but the people shouldn't resort to violence. So those, that's a pretty clear message, and want the President Morsi to make it, to take into account the views of all Egyptians who want to be representative, want to be represented. Question, quote, but the regime is, it is respecting or not respecting freedom of expression. Answer, quote, look, our point for the Egyptian leaders is that they uh, need to demonstrate a clear commitment for all Egyptians regardless of ethnicity, gender, political affiliations, or religious belief, and that's a broad, broad message to all Egyptian leadership. Question, so, and if they don't, uh, answer, quote, look, I'm not going to get in. Question, quote, this is, this is, that's hypothetical. Answer, quote, I'm not going into the hypotheticals. Question, and it's funny and amusing, and it's, a, it's a, as Hani ended his talk about, really, ironically, it's a, the same exact discourse, as if really two years, more than two years of bloodshed, of a betrayal of a democratic revolution happened and financed and supported by the U.S. as if nothing took place, uh, the same discourse. Um, so so I, uh, I'm, as I said, I will talk in bullet points, and one of the first bullet points is the, uh, uh, the, the transition. We had a situation of a horrible transition, bad transition. Why is that? It's, the, it's a the very simple thing that the army, the army was the administrator uh, of the transition. So part of the ruling class administering the transition to democracy. And a patriarchal institution, hierarchical institution, part of the ruling regime that the revolution took place against is leading the transition. Uh, it's very paradoxic. Um, so, uh, and Three, of course, uh, brotherhood, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, the U.S. Uh, government, and the military, they seem to have a, some, of course, they are not on the same page, and of, it's so simplistic to say that there is a just one-time deal to counter-revolution, uh, uh, to lead the counter-revolution against, uh, but it's, there is a, tons of conflicts, but at the same time, the three agree on they have a vision, of, a vision of a conditional democracy. The U.S. for not losing U Egypt as an ally uh, on, on the imperial policy, politics in the Middle East, uh, a Muslim Brotherhood, they have a vision about expanding their uh, Islamic State, um, uh, so using a ballot box as a step for their, their uh, uh, illusionary dream. Uh, uh, the army is, its red line is their economic empire. Uh, and so forth. And I will talk more about details about the army. So they agree on a con sort of conditional democracy. Um, the, 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 the general conclusion is that transition was a transition of counter-revolutions, uh, led by counter-revolutionary forces. And I will talk more uh, about that. Um, so there is many things to be said about this, but I will. This is, we can open the discussion. Why, how, and lots of details. And the general, the general idea, and we agree, and some may agree that uh, election is a way to defeat revolutions. Just to rush to election, nothing. And uh, the one main thing to remember is that no revolutionary forces of any sort took any role in in discussions in writing the constitution, in the, like the drafting the constitution, the, the, pre, the, the tentative constitution, uh, nor the permanent or the one that's uh, enacted by the brotherhood. They, they didn't take a role on this. The, the first step was the army decided upon a committee, so the army, the ruling class, decided to make a committee to draft a, 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 an amendment to a constitution that's Mubarak's constitution. So Mubarak generals, Pentagon's friends deciding how to run things uh, with no voice of any sort. So this is the general thing. The bad transition, horrible transition led by counter-revolutions. Second conclusion or uh, uh, general idea is that the idea about the uh, uh, dichotomy of either Islamist or the old regime or either Islamist or the, or the military. It's like really some idea that uh, 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 expanded and inflated and, and, and supported by the media, by 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 uh, the, the uh, many academics and analysts, and, and I'm not saying the U.S. 
government per se, but this is, as I say, these are two strongest organizational entities that we deal with in Egypt are the military and the, so we have no choice, as if people have no choice to choose, as if there is no alternative. There is alternatives, but the alternatives be being crushed. And the two years and a half, actually, people were run over by armored vehicles and killing, and like there is many, like, t and, 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 and sexual harassment and rape in Tahrir and Morsi. Under Mubarak, there was no rape in Tahrir. There was a systematic sexual harassment that taking place in, since 2005, but never happened that is a rape in Tahrir. That's happened under Morsi. And I will talk about that. That, uh, of course, I am not, I'm warning from the trap of being simplistic Islamophobe that the Islamists are doing blank and we are the uh, uh, liberals uh, with good heart go to save. This is not the case. It's uh, complicated and it's not, they are not bad because they are Islamists. Uh, simply, or uh, it's, more, uh, it's as Hani brilliantly uh, uh, expanded on the organizational history and the, the, the brotherhood mindset. Um, so the dichotomy is endorsed, is uh, inflated. It's a miserable comparison too, to compare Morsi or the, the military or Morsi and Mubarak. It's really this, see, and when, when I read human rights report about comparing human rights abuses under Mubarak and Morsi, it's upsetting and uh, miserable. Like people died, so there's millions, and 20% to, to, to of the Egyptian people went took the streets in 2011, not to have a less torture or a less police abuse or a less, uh, uh, like it, this is, it's not a less censorship. It's not, people have, that's the, the demands where dignity was more genuine democracy. And I forgot to say a, bi a big note about when I talked about transition about representative democracy. And I, I, I attended the panel uh, on U.S. imperialism in the Middle East, and also the the beautiful panel in the morning about Taksim. And let's see, we have to talk about the representative democracy or the bourgeoisie democracy that uh, Egyptian people don't give a damn about. Uh, Morsi is the ballot box. It's a, you have a ballot box. We have 17. We have exceeded your. But it's actually about democracy in the street. We have to question your paradigm. The U.S. is happy with the ballot box, and Morsi. Uh, as long as it, this is not the question of, we have to question the, uh, the, this whole thing. It's not representative democracy as Hani uh, talked about the uh, 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 commerce, like the parliament as office of commerce. And so this is the second conclusion, the dichotomy, we have to talk, there is our alternatives and there's many other things and I'm not talking about that. But uh, the third point is the military and I know that people may know uh, like why the military is a counter revolution, military is not. Multi, multi is, exa is, is literally the Mubarak state is back. Um, just to, let's say out clear five reasons quickly why and how we think that if military is stepping down, this is a an, an significant backlash to the January revolt um, that's being continued uh, now. So the first reason is that they are the ruling class, economically speaking. like. Uh, there is statistics about that. Uh, they are uh, to, the owning 20, 15 to 40 percent. Some saying this is exaggeration about uh, 40, but maybe 15 uh, of the Egyptian economic assets. That's a military uh, institutions. It's some sort of it's a military industrial complex like what we have in the U.S. So it's not like some army. It, they, they have like they invest in. They're making, they, they are producing, uh, they have uh, plans too for making stoves and, and, and fans and, and uh, water and oil and food and uh, uh, everything. Uh, so they're making a profit uh, out of this. And they have an untaxed, untaxed business and they have uh, gigantic bonuses for the top leading generals um, and uh, free labor, uh, Egyptian who are drafted in the military. So it's a, they are the ruling class. They are a significant part of the ruling class. So that's one reason. Second reason is that they are, the, the, it, the, if we have the, 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 the they are the, the core of the state, the repressive apparatus, like to use the Alto Syrian language, about the, this is a repressive, literally. And actually they came in, they stepped in. And when I, I had a short piece about like the, the army, like how, 
the discourse shifted in the, the 18 days of the revolution every day on the, because of the things that they're losing on the ground. So they actually they didn't step in the first to support or to side the pe with the people. Actually, they are forced to take this position and sacrifice in Mubarak. Uh, so, but always they, they joined and historically in 1977 and in 1986 there's some incident about a mass uprising and or there was a uh, uh, um, central security uh, uprising uh, it's, uh, by poor Egyptians who are in draft or mostly illiterate some se se segment of the uh, police that's run as a military, as a parliamentary thing that's run by the police actually and it's as number that half a million um, soldiers. So they had an uprising. The military always come to crush. This is their role historically. They are not siding. They can't, they are, they are, they are forced to side and sacrifice them with Mubarak because of developments on the ground. So that's the second reason. Third is that the, the military, the Egyptian military is the spinal cord of the US-Egypt relation. So when we talk about imperialism, it's a military. Um, so this is like, uh, uh, when we talk about more than 90% of the aid, when we talk about the aid, we have to like talk really critically what's the aid is. The aid is for the military, it's a military aid. It's a, it's a sister organization that's really for uh, doing everything. The, like, and people are training parts, everything. They are part of the, um, it's a ran organizationally similar to the military industrial complex in the US, but also they have the uh, uh, tie, deep relations like, uh, all the uh, young rank officers, uh, low rank officers come here to train and then they develop relationships with their buddies in the Pentagon uh, over years and that's, uh, and in the, during the 2011 we read like lots of communications, our uh, stories about generals saying that we talked to their buddies and the Pentagon asked them to talk to their buddies in Egypt asking them to to what's the situation on the ground? How are you doing? Uh, let's uh, the, and not shoot, but shoot, like things that shooting or not shooting, it's a big question, we'll talk about that uh, if we can. So this is, uh, fourth reason is, um, the, as I said earlier, they are really the lead, they led the counter revolution and the uh, uh, transition. And they, they, are, they committed murders and injuries and killed Egyptians and tortured Egyptians and forced uh, uh, virginity tests to female protesters. There are many, many things that's documented by human rights reports. And so actually they are, we can't run, and we say that we can, some may argue that they are high, like the, the field marshal and the former secretary of defense and uh, our chief of staff are gone now. So they are not really who is running the business. They are different. Actually, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, the institution who did this and there is no accountability. And actually, the Brotherhood part of the deal is to, in the, in the Constitution, you have uh, time. I have a couple of minutes. Okay. Two minutes? Okay. So I would be, yeah, okay, short. Uh, so the, the expanded military trials to civilians. Officially, this was under Mubarak was not really part of the Constitution. It was like, really, uh, there is some vague interpretation to the military code that since Nasser time, but under Morsi, it is constitutionalized to uh, try civilians. Uh, so fifth and last uh, point about the military, and, and I have uh, two general points later, and we can save them like, about risks or fears, and we, they are really area, but I, as said earlier, but I will say them as like bullet points. But the last point is, the, the institution of the military is like, the, I'm not comparing, there's different historical circumstances. There are two different institutions. There's drafts here, there's no, it's, it's a very simplistic comparison, but it's same patriarchal mentality, sexist, homophobic. This is an institution that uh, the who ran the virginity tests. So, and they have many fascinating, sometimes leaks of discourse run by top military generals about, we have to uh, like screw those kids of Tahrir, who do you think they are? We have to like, Things like that. Uh, this is uh, uh, things can't be out of order. We have to. This is like some people uh, reviewed some of these. Uh, it's interesting things. Um, so the the bullet points are one is risks. Uh, so as one as earlier the uh, Hania Mustafa about the the coup, fear of military coup in the planned June uh, 30th protests that started today uh, and this week. So. We have to be aware of that, uh, uh, and it's the long discussion what to do. And the second thing is a concern or a fear 
that there is, as Mustafa said, it's a, and we can talk about, I mean, the, the counter revolution as a concept is really we have to be aware that it's, it's, a, it's not static, it's not limited to the domestic politics. It could be a regional, international, and also uh, it's not homogeneous. Uh, so we have counter revolution forces in both sides, actually. With the, the, it's headed by the Brotherhood because the other power, the leading, but there are some counter revolution for, uh, voices in rebel and as so that's we so the what the the concern is that June thirtieth is planned as if, as if it's only anti brotherhood like there's some sort of uh, especially by state apparatus and people who are close to the regime they fed this Islamophobic and anti Ikhwan uh, anti brotherhood uh, discourse that's as it, and losing track of the original. Liberty, dignity, human dignity, social justice uh, um, um, slogans of the revolution. It's a concern. It's not, uh, I mean, the rebel started by revolutionary forces. Uh, but it's, it's important to um, be aware. And in those bullet points, positive notes, uh, um, one is even if, regardless, getting rid of Morsi's power or not. Um, and have an area impeachment or area uh, presidential election, um, it's, we are not back to square one. So some, even if the, I'm not saying that if the military will, the, of course the, there is a, some sort of a compromise or like a uh, consensus between military and the uh, US that they can't be visible coup. They can't do this again. And they can't do something along the lines of what happened uh, two years ago. Uh, but people learned a lot. And as Mustafa said, things are expanded and uh, handy about rebel is going beyond the Tahrir paradigm, uh, going to squares. And actually, some, some tweaked even Tahrir uh, paradigm. They are not really going to rural areas only, but actually they have their own sit-ins in major popular poor neighborhoods, like Kit Kat in Baba neighborhood. They started the sit-in. Uh, so, yeah. So we are not back to square one, regardless of what happened. Uh, second positive note is we already tested political Islam project. And we got the worst of them, sadly, and unfortunately, but it's a, a project that has religious, some weird, illusionary, uh, it's, it, this is a, a religious narrative about liberation, but the heart of it, um, neoliberal policies and same ties with the imperialism. But we tested them for many people who had hope about those people who are, they fear God, they may not be corrupt or so forth. They are being seen on the ground. Uh, they crushed workers. And we, uh, we know uh, uh, conservative Islamist Salafi uh, leaders of uh, working class who are leading movement. And they said, we, I voted for Morsi. I, I, I collected 15 thousand votes for Morsi, but I know that the, I, the first one, Mubarak never jailed me, but Morsi jailed me. So we learned, so people are learning and uh, so that's a, um, so I will stop here. Uh, thank you. Uh.